we are going through a period of time right now in the book of Acts where there is a lot of change that's happening. And actually next week I will talk about how to endure change without it killing you. Okay, and that's uh, what the church has to learn and constantly be reminded of. But there is some personal change along the way that happens that change people's lives forever. Okay, if you were called to a courtroom and you were told that you were going to give testimony in a court case, how would you feel? I don't know about you, but I, I don't know that I've ever had to give testimony in a court case, but it kind of gives me a little bit of a chill, just a little bit. Like, what are they going to ask me? Am I going to get it right? Am I going to get caught in something that I shouldn't be caught up in? And uh, again, people that are closest to me say, if you just always tell the truth, you don't ever have to worry about anything. And, and I get that, and I understand that. When you go to that courtroom, you often you're asked to put your, raise your hand up in the air or put your hand on a Bible, and you're told to repeat after me, I promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God, right? That's what testimony is all about. And, and again, that kind of puts a little bit more seriousness uh, in the process of telling your testimony, whatever it is. But there's another form of testimony that I think is really important and maybe more important to us in the way that we live. And it is the testimony that is your story. That is your story. Have you ever asked somebody who you watch from afar, maybe you asked your wife or your husband, ask them, well, I wonder what their story is. Maybe you see some actions or some things that happen along the way and you wonder, how did they get where they got in order to do the things that they're doing? What's their story? You know, people ask us that about, that about us as well. Maybe never to our face at all, but everybody has a story and nobody has the exact same story. It all has different kind of components to it and different kinds of uh, ideas in it. Some of those stories are inspiring and some of them are rather mundane. Some of them are miraculous and some of them aren't. But we've all got a story to tell. We all have a Christian testimony or a Christian story to tell as well. And I think I put these in your notes here under testimony. The three components of a good testimony are how, or how I was or what I was before before I came to Jesus, how I came to Jesus, and then lastly, the difference that Jesus has made in me. That can, that can make up your entire story that you can tell somebody about, about Jesus. Well, Acts chapter 9 is a testimony. It's a testimony about Saul of Tarsus and his story. And I want you to remember that in, in Acts chapter 1, Jesus had told the disciples, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and even to the utter ends of the earth. And so there was going to be a time when there was going to be this scattering of the church and the church was going to have to know their story, whatever it was, however it went. And uh, that's where we are introduced to Saul of Tarsus in Acts chapter 8. If you look at chapter 8, you'll see there in verse 1 that Saul had been there on the day that Stephen had been persecuted. Jake talked about this last week, and it said there that on that, great, on that day a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him, but Saul began to destroy the church. And going house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. That literally was the mission of Saul of Tarsus. He was a Jewish leader in that day, perfect in almost every way. When you think about Saul of Tarsus, you think about him being the greatest persecutor of the church. And that's what he was at that point. But he was also a Jewish expert, trained in the highest Jewish laws, knew them inside and out. And the one thing that Saul of Tarsus was sure about at this point in his life is that Christianity, as it was being laid out to the world, was a lie. Jesus was not the Messiah. Jesus did not rise from the dead. He was convinced he, deep in his soul that that was true. And so when he was out persecuting the church, he was literally out doing God's work. 
He really believed that, that he was going to do God's work by doing this. And in chapter 9, verse 1, we read, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. And he went to the high priest and he asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. So that was his mission. His mission was to go and to find those people that called themselves Christians and try to destroy them and to eliminate them completely and to destroy this church. Now, the question that I've asked along the way is, is why Damascus? Why Damascus? Damascus has been in the news this week because of the strikes in Syria and so forth. And so it's not very far from Jerusalem at all. It's probably a six-day journey on foot kind of a deal. And here's Saul who's going to Damascus. Well, there were about 40,000 Jews in Damascus during that time. And many of those Jews had heard about the way and actually had become associated with the way. And so Saul thought, there's all these people who are part of this cult, and that's what he thought it was, was a cult. I'm going to go to Damascus and I'm going to get them all and drag them back to Jerusalem, put them on trial, and eventually kill them. That's what his goal was, was to kill them and to exterminate Christianity once and for all. And so while Saul was in Jerusalem, he was giving his approval to those who were stoning Stephen. But now he went on his way to Damascus. He got out of town. And when he got out of town, something happened. It says there in verse 3, As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Now, what I want you to notice, and maybe you ought to take it in your Bibles and circle this word, it's the word me. Why do you persecute me? Did you ever think about how personal this was with Jesus? He didn't say, why are you persecuting the church? Why are you persecuting my believers? He was saying, you are persecuting me personally. You are in my face. You're persecuting what I believe in and what I have done for the church in a very real sense. And so Saul asks him, who are you, Lord? Another word that you ought to circle is the word Lord there, because I get the feeling that this is the first time maybe in Saul's entire life that he is not in control. And so he uses this word Lord to acknowledge that he is now in a subservient position to whoever it is that has knocked him down on the ground on the road to Damascus. He's no longer giving directions. He's no longer the boss. He's no longer the one that's doing, uh, telling everybody where to go and what to say at all. All of a sudden, all he is doing with his face down in the dirt is saying, Who are you, Lord? Who are you, Lord? Obviously, I'm not greater than you. You've got to be greater than me. And of course, he says there, Jesus says in verse 5, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. Now, don't miss this about Saul. And if you read much in the gospel or in the, in the letters of the New Testament, you realize that Saul had every reason to be prideful about who he was. And yet this was an incredibly humbling moment for Saul. All of a sudden, he was on his face, down on his face, and he was taking orders from somebody that he couldn't even see. Jesus had a plan in verse 6. He said, go up, go into the city. I have someone who's waiting for you. And so Saul did that. He obeyed. He was obedient to what, Saul, what God wanted him to do. And then it says in verse 7, it says, The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They had heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Okay? So they hear all this conversation. They see their leader flat on his face. He can't see. They hear the words, but they don't see anybody. And I'm sure they thought that they were lose, losing their minds. But Saul got up from the ground, and when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. And so they led him by the hand into Damascus. I'm sure that's not what those guys thought they would be doing that day when they headed into Damascus. Would be leading Saul of Tarsus into the city because he was blind and totally dependent on them at that point. But this is how it works many times when somebody who is a persecutor of the church, they are so humbled that they have nothing that they can stand on on their own at all. 
And so they led them, in verse, in verse 8, they led him by the hand into Damascus. And for three days he was blind and he, and he did not eat or drink or anything. Some of us went last week to watch the movie Saul of Tarsus and, uh, and watched how they portrayed it. And it's made me think a lot this week about what happened during those three days. Those three days. What was going on in Saul's mind during those three days? Was there any significance to it being three days? If you know what I mean. Okay. Was it just because it was the same as Jesus being in the tomb and then risen on the third day? What did he think about? What was going on in his mind during that time? And I'm sure that a lot of things that were going on in his mind had to do with the fact that here he was all of a sudden in this completely humble position, not being able to do anything at all. And he's trying to figure out where, where did this come from? What is this all about? This is something different than I've ever experienced in my life. And so Jesus has this plan. He says, go in the city, and I have somebody waiting for you. And so he went. And this created then a huge conflict in his own mind about what he had known all of his life and what he was going through right now. It was all part of his story. And, uh, you know, each one of us have a story, don't we? All of us do. And all of us have a part of a story where we have to make some decisions where we choose to go one way or go the other way. And that was what was happening with Saul of Tarsus in Damascus. Our story also, almost always, now I can't say every single time, but almost always includes somebody else. And for Paul, or Saul as he was named then, it was this man named Ananias. And that's kind of an interesting part of this story, and it is part of the story. It says, in Damascus, in verse 10, there was a disciple named Ananias, and the Lord called to him in a vision. Ananias, yes, Lord, he answered. It's strange how people, when they hear from God, they always answer with, yes, Lord, okay? It's kind of like they get it. And the Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. And in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Now these are, these are direct orders from the top, okay? This is not from somebody down the line a little bit. This is from God himself. Direct orders from God. And Ananias has an answer for these direct orders from God. Lord, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm that he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. In other words, here's Ananias saying to God, do you know who this guy is? The the reports have spread all over the land of what he does. He kills Christians and you're sending him to me or me to him? There's no way that I'm going to sign up for that assignment at all. But look what happens in verse 15. It says, but the Lord said to Ananias, go, go. Now I take that, and I've got that underlined in my Bible as God is really serious about this. Go. I'm not going to argue with you about this at all. And you know, there have been times when I've had to say that to my kids, I am not going to argue with you about this. This is the way it's going to be. And then he says this, This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. You remember earlier I said that we're entering into a period in the book of Acts where there is enormous change happening. And you're going to see that especially next week in chapter 10. Well, here is Saul being told, or Ananias being told by God, all I want you to do is to go. I have chosen him as my instrument to go to the Gentiles and to their kings. Now, when he heard the word Gentiles and their kings, I'm sure that kind of perked up a little bit because God, they believed, only had something to do with Jews. The Gentiles were dogs, and certainly they wouldn't be interesting to God at all, period. But here's God saying, I've got a plan. I've got a plan for even the Gentiles and what's going on in their life. And so he becomes a character in this story. If you read on in verse 17, it says that Ananias went to the house and entered it and placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, which I love that, Brother Saul, you know, it's kind of like, Brother Saul, I wish I could say that kind of like Wilbur Fields did, you know, Brother Saul, 
The Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Wow. Couldn't you imagine maybe Ananias was feeling like he was having an out-of-body experience here? That he would even be talking to Saul? And that he would be calling him brother? And they would be talking about how God's going to fill him with the Holy Spirit? Wow. And immediately, verse 18 says, something that like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. And he got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. Now, one of the things I love about the movie, and I'm going to say a spoiler alert here, but I love how they portrayed the baptism of Saul in the movie. Because they don't do a lot of talking about it. They just move from this moment to all of a sudden, it's like they're taking this camera shot, looking up, into the, up above Saul, and he is in the water. And I thought when I saw the movie, and then as I read this, I thought, I wonder how it felt for Ananias to be in the water with Saul of Tarsus, the one who is persecuting the whole church, has this reputation, is destroying the whole church. And I could just see Saul of Tarsus saying, okay, Saul, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Yes, I do. He's the Lord. Then I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Die to yourself and raise to walk in a new life. I don't know if he did all that stuff or not. All that stuff we kind of pile on there. But whatever the moment was, it must have been an incredible moment for Ananias. Just to be in that water with him. And to watch as God writes and completes that part of Saul's story. His story. And so then it comes there that we have this picture of Saul now with a testimony, with a story. And it continues on in verse uh, 20 and beyond. It says, Saul sent several days with the disciples in Damascus. And at once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus was the Son of God. Now, remember, before he had preached, <coughs> excuse me, before he had preached, that Jesus was not the Son of God. All of a sudden, he's preaching now that Jesus is the Son of God. And implied in that is that Jesus did die, that Jesus was buried, that Jesus rose from the dead on the third day. All of that's implied in that statement there. And he was defending now the resurrection of Jesus Christ in the synagogues. This was a new man with a new story, for sure. And to all those who heard him were astonished and asked, Isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who called upon his name? That makes sense. Isn't he the one who was going to kill all the Christians? And yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Messiah. After many days had gone by, there was a conspiracy among the Jews to kill him. Now, I would put in there, if I were writing this, just parenthetically, get used to this. Okay, because that's what's going to happen to Saul all the way along. And uh, it goes on there and says, Day and night they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him, but his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. And I, thought, I just thought about that, and I thought about how humbling that must have been for Saul at that point. That he was being saved by these Jewish people who said, Here's how we're going to get you out of town. We're going to put you in this basket. We're going to lower you in this opening. And then you're going to get out. And then you run for the hills. You know, get out of here. God's going to watch out after you. And of course, it says there in verse 26, when he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was really a disciple. I could see that. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. And he told him how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him. And how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem and spoke boldly in the name of the Lord. And he talked and debated with the Hellenistic Jews, but they tried to kill him. And when the believers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. And then we have this kind of parenthetical little statement from Luke. It says, then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened. Living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, it increased in numbers. 
There's a whole lot there that we could talk about today, but here's what I want to kind of apply this passage to us today. Number one, God chooses who he wants to use, and it's never a surprise to him. God chooses who he wants to use, and it's never a surprise to him. If you read through the Bible and you see this all as one story, like I do, you see over and over that there are surprises to us. God chose to use a prostitute by the name of Rahab to help the people of Israel. And that wouldn't have been the, that would have been the last person I would have used, but he did. He chose to use this relatively unknown person named Abraham to become the father of all the nations. He used this shepherd boy who was the last pick in terms of all of the family of Jesse. He used that shepherd boy. Nobody would have ever paid attention to him in a hundred years. And finally, the, the prophet said, do you have anybody else? Because none of these other boys can be the king. And he said, well, I got the shepherd boy. He sat out watching the fields. Get him. Get him now. He's the one I'm going to use. And you know, if I were to make a top 100 list of people that I would want to witness to and share my story with, I can be pretty sure that I would have never had Saul's name on that list at all. It would have been too risky. It would have been too much at stake here. And it wouldn't have done any good. I know how much he hated Christians. And yet here is God writing a new story in Saul's life and giving him a testimony along the way. When God was ready to take the gospel global, he chose Saul, the most unlikely of people. It reminded me of a story of somebody that will be familiar to some of you back in the 1970s during the Watergate days when a man by the name of Chuck Colson had been kind of the hatchet man for Richard Nixon and his presidency and had done all kinds of things that weren't right, illegal and and so forth and ended up being put in prison. And it was in prison, and right before he went into prison, that he began to think about God and God's purpose for his life. And while he was in prison, he began to develop a plan and he began to write a story. And it was a story that God would use in his life for the rest of his days on earth until he just died recently. And one of the things that he did was, is he started a ministry to prisoners called Prison Fellowship. And he would go all over the world, into South America, into Africa, into the United States, Europe, everywhere that he could go. He would go into those prisons and he would share the gospel and hopefully write a different story for some of those prisoners because God had written a different story for him. It doesn't have to be complex. For Colson, it really wasn't complex. You can read about it in any of his books. But he preached the gospel to millions of people. Because God chose to use him in a very significant way in the last part of last century and this century. That's the way God is. God chooses to use people and it's never a surprise as to who he uses. And that means he chooses to use you too. And it may be in a very significant way. It may be in a very private way. You may not even know that you're being used. But it's never a surprise when God puts his hand or his finger on you and says, I want you to tell your story to so and so because it's going to make a difference in their life. The second thing is this, that God rarely ever works in a vacuum. God rarely ever works in a vacuum. What do I mean by that? I mean that God believes in team efforts. God uses other people to help write our story. In Saul's story, we have Ananias and we have Barnabas. We have other believers, but Ananias and Barnabas especially were key parts of the story being written for Saul of Tarsus. You may be a great preacher of the gospel, or you may influence somebody who is a great preacher of the gospel, but obviously somebody had to influence you as well. Somebody had to make a comment or something to you along the way. My, for me, that part of that story was, by, was, 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 was written by a man named David Henry. You don't know David Henry at all. He was a 40-year-old youth minister that most people would have looked at and said he's kind of washed up and not very influential at all. But David Henry was the one who got me to thinking about God and got me to thinking about my life and where I was when I was 21 years old. And I knew David Henry for six months. And then I went off on my life and I did my thing and eventually became a Christian and became a preacher and all that stuff. And I never ever could catch up with David Henry again at all. But when I write my story... David Henry always shows up in my story. Always does. 
Just that little bit of influence was one of the things that helped turn a corner for me in my life. That's true for famous people as well. I was reading this week about Billy Graham some, and you know about Billy Graham and how he preached to millions and millions and millions of people. When he was a young man, you know who his hero was? It was Babe Ruth. That was his hero. He loved Babe Ruth. He knew everything about Babe Ruth there was to know about Babe Ruth. <clears throat> he was uh, quite a connoisseur of, base <coughs> of baseball. And Babe Ruth was his guy. But there were other people that were in his life helping him write the story. There was a man by the name of Grady Wilson. You may not know Grady Wilson at all unless you know the story really well and have dug pretty deep. All Grady Wilson did was is he talked Billy Graham into going to a revival meeting in Charlotte, North Carolina in 1934. That's all he did. Why don't you just come with me? Billy Graham said, I don't know if I really want to go or not. Why don't you just come with me? Just come one time. And so Billy Graham went. And he heard a man by the name of Mordecai Ham preach the gospel. And whatever Mordecai Ham said with the help of the Holy Spirit that day changed the direction of Billy Graham's life forever. And all of a sudden, it was not Babe Ruth who was his hero. It was Jesus Christ. And he spent the rest of his life and days preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's a simple story. And it's a story that you have and a story that he has and that I have, written by God, using people in our life in order to put us in a position to where we can give glory to God. And as he did, he dedicated his life to Jesus and preached to millions. You may not think a lot about this, and you may think, well, I'm not a Billy Graham, and I'm not somebody famous with lots of money and that kind of thing. I, I know that. But I'll tell you what, for everybody who's done something great for God, there's probably been a teacher a teacher in a class, maybe in a first grade class, maybe in a high school class, or a coach, or a neighbor friend, or somebody at church that just showed a little bit of interest in the life of those young people and watched them grow and eventually come to Christ and begin to write their own story. That's why the whole idea about saying yes is so important in the life of a church. Because all of us have stories and have opportunities to influence, especially young people in significant ways. And I love what one of the ladies said on the video earlier. I just wanted to come alongside of them. I just want to invest in them. Because you never know. And you may invest in a school classroom or on a bus or something like that or in a team situation. But it may be here in church, whatever it is. But I just want you to know that when you invest, you influence. You influence. And for Ananias, the story could have stopped right there with him refusing to be used by God and walking away from God, but instead he obeyed. And he did what seemed like the most unlikely thing that he could do, which was to go and to talk to Saul and to be God's instrument in that way. And he did it because he knew it was God that had called him to do it. And so I wonder today, even right now, as you've heard this message and if you've seen what we're talking about today with Say Yes, if there isn't some of you today who have had that tap on the shoulder where, I, where God has said, I can use you, and if you stand up and say, yes, God wants to use me in children's ministry, everybody in this room might, might say, you've got to be kidding me. You're the last one I'd want to be using in children's ministry. But you know what? God chooses who he uses. And it's never a surprise to him. And it may be that way for youth ministry. It may be that way for some other kind of ministry in this church as we influence especially the next generation coming up. The last thing I want to say to you today is this. Do what you are called to do and then trust God with the results. And that's not in your notes. You'll have to scribble that down. But do what you are called to do and trust God with the results. I am sure that Ananias must have thought, God, you've got to be crazy. This is not going to be a good thing at all. But what was Ananias most concerned about? Obeying God. Obeying God. And so he went. You see, everybody's got a story. Everyone does. There's not a man or a woman or a child in this room that doesn't have a story. And you've got a story that either God has written or God is writing in your life.
Somebody once said, I don't think I can really tell my testimony because it's too long and it's too, too, got too many components to it. It'd be too tough to do that. And so another person st stopped him in the conversation and they said, you know what? The great testimonies of this world are exactly three elevator stops long. You ought to be able to write your testimony down and be able to say it in three elevator stops, wherever you are. It ought to be that simple. Because when you get right down to it, your testimony is who you were before you became a Christian, how you became a Christian, and what difference has Christ made in your life. And if you can boil that down into one or two paragraphs and be able to tell somebody your testimony, you never know how God might use that in your life and in the life of the ones that are listening to change them or to help them begin to write their own story as well. So we got Saul of Tarsus here, who's eventually going to become Paul of Tarsus. We're going to go into a period next week of enormous change in the church, significant change, and nobody likes change in the church. Nobody likes change at all in the church. And I've always known this, and I've learned this the hard way through the years, that people hope that nothing will ever change in the church because it's always changing everywhere outside of the church. But when you see in Acts 10, what you see is a church that is constantly changing in order to accomplish God's goals. And that's where we're going to go next week. This week, write your testimony. Take a half hour and write down the answer to these questions. What was I like before I became a Christian? How did I become a Christian? What difference does it make in my life now that Christ is in my life? And begin to let that be the formulation of your story as well. Why don't you stand if you would, please. In just a minute, we're going to pray and then we'll sing. I'll be down front here if you want to talk about anything or pray about anything. Uh, this can be a great time of prayer. And we encourage you to invest in this as well. And I encourage you to make commitments in your own heart and soul about your testimony, about your story. Write your story. And then let God use it. Now, Father, would you remind us that you are busy writing for us and that you're working in our lives. Help us to be faithful to you in the story that you've given us, to share it with other people, not just to keep it to ourselves, but to share it and then to watch you use it, not because we're good, but because you're good, not because we have some great story to tell, but because you have the greatest story to tell, the story of Jesus. In his name we pray, amen.